Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here for this evening's uh, special event. Before I begin, could uh, I ask you to make sure your mobile phone is switched uh, to silent? Uh, we're live streaming this event, so welcome to all our online viewers. Uh, and with your uh, silent mobile phone, do feel free to uh, tweet about our event. The hashtag is hashtag RSA RDI. Tonight is a very special night in the RSA's calendar. We'll be presenting diplomas to designers who've been appointed a royal designer for industry by the RSA in 2013. Established in 1936, the distinction of RDI is the highest accolade for designers in the UK. It's awarded by the RSA to designers who've shown sustained design excellence, work of aesthetic value, and significant benefit to society. The new members added this evening to the Faculty of Royal Designers for Industry mean that we currently have 142 RDIs and 56 honorary RDIs. Only 200 designers are able to hold the distinction RDI at any one time, and non-UK designers are awarded the honorary title. Since its foundation, the RSA has encouraged and supported design and innovation, recognizing its importance to industry and society, enhancing the country's prosperity and our quality of life. This year, there's a new and I think very welcome uh, element to our proceedings. Uh, in addition to giving the prestigious RDI honor to recognize designers at the pinnacle of professional achievement, the RSA is also proud to continue our encouragement and support of emerging designers through our annual RSA Student Design Awards. And we thought it would be good to start talking a bit more about the Student Design Awards at this fantastic event that we hold uh, every year. Established in 1924, the RSA Student Design Awards challenged designers in training to apply their skills in new ways to a range of complex social issues. This evening, we're highlighting three of the most successful projects in recent years, and we're pleased to announce that these design graduates are here tonight, and you can find out more about their projects during the drinks reception in the Benjamin Franklin Room after this event. In 2011, Stuart Kench and Helen Parry from Kingston University responded to a brief asking students to design innovative ways to raise funding and awareness for charities. Stuart and Helen designed Donate at the Gate, a quick and efficient way for people to show their support for charities that fits into a daily routine. The Donate at the Gate scheme works by taking a few pennies off their travel card and donating it to charity if customers use the, de the designated gate. This eliminates the hassle of being stopped in a daily commute and most importantly provides people with a choice of whether or not to donate, making it simple and convenient. In 2012, James Langdon from the University of Nottingham designed the Gentler Guider, a customized dog harness for guide dogs for the blind. James responded to a brief asking students to look at how new technologies such as additive manufacture, 3D printing, could be used to improve products for people with disabilities. James focused on the harness for guide dogs for the blind and found out that the existing harness is heavy, ill-fitting, and has not actually been redesigned for 80 years. His solution provides a new option that's lighter and comfortable for the dog, meaning that more dogs will pass their guide dog training. In addition, it's easier to use and more ergonomic for the guide dog owner. Richard Waters from Northumbria University responded to a brief about how to improve the daily commute. Richard spoke to many commuters who revealed that the current design of the national rail tickets is a major source of stress because it's hard to find the most important information and there are many unnecessary additional items such as seat reservations that are displayed on the ticket. <coughs> Richard used principles of information hierarchy to reimagine the standard issue rail ticket for better ease of use and understanding within the confines of the current ticketing system. These images are only an extract of the design thinking and skills that went into these projects and I hope that you'll take the opportunity later this evening to speak to these young designers in the Benjamin Franklin room. Uh, I'd just now like to ask James, Stuart, Helen and Richard, sorry to embarrass you folks, but to stand up and please join me in congratulating them. Following the RDI presentations this evening, graphic and digital designer Malcolm Garrett will be inaugurated as the new master of the Royal Designers. And then, according to tradition, Malcolm will give this year's RDI address. 
In a moment, I'll hand over to the outgoing master of the Royal Designers, Exhibitions and Interior Designer, Dinah Casson, who will invite the new members of the faculty to receive their diplomas. But before doing so, I would like to sincerely thank Dinah for working with the faculty and the RSA over the past two years. We gratefully acknowledge that the role of RDI Master is taken on thanks to the generosity and commitment of individual RDIs who are keen to work with other designers in the faculty to meet the charitable aims of the RSA. Dinah, your generous contribution has been appreciated by us all. Thank you. I'm told I mustn't press any of Malcolm's buttons, so if I tread <laughs> delicately, it's because I'm terrified I'm going to do something awful. Since we met this time last year, we've lost six members of our faculty, and we'd like to take the opportunity just to think about them for a few minutes and to look at some of their work.
rather incredible to think that Ron Carter was one of my tutors and dear James Irvin was one of my students, it sort of feels. Um, it's not surprising, although um, very sad, that Paul Brown is not here tonight. One glimpse of his portfolio makes it clear that he has to treat the globe like most of us use the Metro. Uh, 2011 in St. Petersburg, Berlin, Zurich, 2012, Gothenburg, London, Birmingham, 2013, Tokyo, Glyndebourne, Pesaro, and that's just his opera projects. And we know that the role of the theatre designer changes from director to director, but Paul has been fortunate enough to work with directors such as Graham Vick and Jonathan Kent, who willed him on to create some of the most memorable theatrical productions of recent years. I've been fortunate enough to witness some of them, and um, I can say that the vast spiral staircase uh, with a flaming handrail landing in a, in a glass stage of marigolds is pretty memorable. Paul is one of the UK's most significant costume designers, and his work for theatre and opera is international. Here you see his designs for Aida, Nabucco, Pelias and Melisande, uh, Mitridate, and in this way, he is a global ambassador for British theatre design, partly because he's a British designer, but partly because his productions of The Midsummer Marriage, Peter Grimes, Coriolanus, Richard II, The Tempest Show, all, of course, of British authorship, and these have inspired some of his most startling and visionary work. And that makes direct contact and connection to contemporary audiences, who in turn respond to the daring originality of his vision. He says, our job is to give substance to the most sublime achievements of the world's greatest designers, uh, writers and composers. Our relevance and importance is that if done well, our work can change lives. It can give validation to any member of our audience. This he has succeeded in doing more than most and the appetite for live opera broadcasts and cinemas and outdoor screens have included Paul's productions of Purcell's Fairy Queen and Britain's Turn of the Screw, both from Glyndebourne. He received the Diploma of Honour at the 1999 Prague Quadrinale and has won the Critics Circle Award in 2000, 2001 and an Evening Standard Best Designer Award. And in 2001, he designed the costumes for Angels and Insects, for which he received an Oscar nomination. Paul trained under the legendary British theatre designer Margaret Percy Harris, a winner of the RSA Bicentenary Medal in 1997, who says he wisely she wisely taught him why and not how. And this has prompted us to wonder why he's not yet an RDI, and so we are proud to be able to put that right. And the how will be solved by Tim O'Brien, who is receiving it on Paul's behalf. why one might kiss Ian Cartledge's hem if he had one. But the main one would be for helping us to survive in many of our esteemed public, public buildings, designed with such clarity on plan, but with such opacity in reality. The most well-known perhaps is the Barbican Arts Centre. And with Studio Myerskov, he is the one we have to thank for transforming a dark, sad old crinkle face back to front building that's had so many facelifts into a dynamic, navigable place that can nearly be a pleasure to be in. No more lost souls drifting around in distant corridors here. Uh, nor at King's Place, nor in the Tate Tanks, nor in the RCA. No more exhausting trails around Selfridges, feeling victim to the get them lost and they will buy marketing department. This aspect of his work is about reassurance and trust. Come with me and I will show you, you don't need a map, I will be there when you want me. And what more can you ask of a designer? So it's social benefit to me. Um, but he does other things as well. His design consultancy, Cartridge Levine, has been at it for over 20 years. Set up after an apprenticeship with Conrad and Associates, he has applied a clear, logical, modernist, clean, precise, and minimalist typographic aesthetic 
to magazines, packaging, publications of every kind, as well as the valuable wayfinding, which is his most public work. He gives organizations their identity, setting them up as an extension of himself. Quiet, appropriate, thoughtful, but still dynamic and compelling. His work has been enormously influential, burning a steady flame for the sometimes unfashionable Swiss school of modernist elegance, but its underlying strengths show it to be more complex than that, more sensitive, more responsive, and more enjoyable. He can do big scale and small scale, noisy and quiet, with equal confidence and success, which is a rare thing. Ian's work has won three DNAD Silver Awards, two Design Society Awards, and four International Typographic Awards, and we are delighted that ours will go alongside these. Welcome to the faculty, Ian Cartledge. Hussein Chalain has refused to remain catalogued. He is a magician, transforming one thing into another before our eyes. He makes coffee tables into skirts, airmail letters into dresses, frocks into laser projections, coats into shawls, collars into helmets. He questions all our assumptions about not only what clothes are, but also what they mean, and then goes on to fully explore the consequences of those questions. The images you see here include garments that explore wearable, portable architecture. The famous dress encrusted with crystals with over 15,000 flickering LED lights and a garment <coughs> made of aircraft construction material which changes shape by remote control and his graduation pieces that had been buried in his garden in a bed of iron filings. Most, and anyone wishing to see some of this ought to go down to the Isabeau exhibition where you can see some of them in Somerset House. Motivated by ideas and disciplines not readily associated with fashion, Hussein Chalain's pioneering work crosses between architecture, design, philosophy, history, anthropology, science, technology. And layered onto this are his preoccupation with the issues of cultural identity, displacement, and migration. Regarding himself as an outsider, he talks about longing to be in Cyprus, where he was born, a longing to be in England, and a longing to be nowhere. Hussein was educated at St. Martin's, and he claims that it was the contrast between life in London, where he found an Anglo-Saxon tolerance, even encouragement of London as a multicultural creative place, and his early life in Turkish Cyprus. Here he found eager collaborators with ease, and this became the foundation of his curiosity. And in addition to carrying the beacon for innovation in fashion design, or probably as a consequence of that, he's worked in the theater, designing costumes for opera and dance, and has worked with filmmakers, industrial designers, musicians, as well as the more expected collaborators in jewelry and textile design. He is the epitome of design collaboration, and he's the source of inspiration, inspiration and audacity to every young fashion designer. He's a courageous man, and his bravery has been recognized by others before us. Twice named British Designer of the Year, 1999 and 2000. He was given a one-man show, a retrospective at the Design Museum in 2009, and awarded an MBE for services to the fashion industry in 2006. The saying, we don't offer bravery awards, uh, but we can and do with great pleasure offer you an RID, RI, <laughs> what is it called, an RDI award. <laughs> so please come and join us. It was clear when the first Apple Macintosh came to market in 1984 that someone at last was thinking of us, just like those early Sony project products where only instinct was needed to operate something super new. This was evidence of a profound change. No surprise then to find that the same designer, Harmut Esslinger, was behind the design strategy for both brands. I beg your pardon, excuse me. Erase that from just. 
If we're searching, <laughs> I'm so sorry. If we're searching, my alphabet's never been very good. If we're searching for someone who defines the full title of RSA, namely the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacture and Commerce, we find it in Lee Edelcourt. She's not only the very definition of encouragement, but she actually lives art, commerce and manufacture. Her work is about the future, the round the corner sort of future, as well as the future that is further away. She has honed her skill over many years and her clients now fear to tread without her. But we're all potential clients and she shares this hypersensitive antennae with anyone who wishes to know. And she does this through a number of parallel paths. One is via a series of breathtakingly beautiful books and magazines. Trend books are published biannually as limited editions and they act as guidebooks to the future for her clients in fashion, textiles, architecture, interiors, automotive, accessories, and cosmetics. Similarly, her magazines have dazzled manufacturers into worlds that they would never have otherwise visited. These publications are about inspiration, about remaining ever observant and caring. And they are about holding on to courage, being brave, and looking forward. Another is through education. During her nearly 10-year te tenure, tenure as chair of Design Academy at Eindhoven, she revolutionized the curriculum, transforming it into one of Europe's premier art schools. There she created new socially conscious courses, such as the master's course in humanitarian design. Inspired by her work at Eindhoven, the Polish city of Poznan invited Lee to direct a new art school, a school of form. And here she curates exhibitions of the work of her young designers, offering the world windows into the immediate future. Another is through Heartware, a non-profit initiative founded with others in 1995, providing long-term help for artisans in developing countries, focusing on the preservation of craft skills and development of projects, products for global markets. And another is through her blog, Trend Tablet, that shares her discoveries with, fo with her followers, such as a new fabric that relieves skin allergies made entirely from milk, and based on a child's toy, a cheap wind-powered device for seeking and destroying landmines. Lee, you're already so richly decorated uh, and by appreciative governments and organization, including the Prince, Prince Bernard Culture Prize of 2012. Ours, so ours may seem to be a small thing in comparison, but in this case, we're the ones to be proud that you've agreed to become an honorary RDI. another go. It was clear <laughs> that when Apple Macintosh came to the market in 1984, that someone was linking of us. And just like those early Sony products, where only instinct was needed to operate something super new, this was evidence of a profound change. And no surprise then to find that the same designer, Harmut Esslinger, was the behind the design strategy for both brands. And nor were we surprised when Expo 2000, Hanover named him as one of the 45 Germans who shaped culture and science in the 20th century. When in 1993, Hammett was asked by the New York Times why most personal computers had been so ugly, he explained that in the early years, the development of the technology occurred faster than the cultural development, faster than people could perceive the changes. There wasn't enough time to think about it. The people who built computers didn't take the effort to think about the user side. The shape of consumer electronics, unlike the analog parents, can be any shape they, we want them to be. What they do need, however, unlike the analog parents, is an interface that's warm, human-driven, and expressive of how we are feeling. Hamid Esslinger was one of the first designers, alongside the likes of Bill Mogridge, RDI, to apply this thinking to the complex hardware and software technology that began to surround us. For Apple in particular, he forged a progressive and rigorous design path, which with his Snow White design strategy, uh, strategy for example, paved the way for his successor at Apple, Jonathan Ive, RDI. This is a fine example of the power of strategic design and innovation, creating more value with less material <laughs> and delivering sustainable and positive experiences. 
and this is the strategy that's been applied to all of the hundreds of products that he has designed. And it's thanks to his pioneering work that pensioners can text their grandchildren on an iPhone, children in Angola can access knowledge on the internet, and no computer maker now dares to display the arrogance of those early machines. We expect to be able to dive straight into everything without a tutorial. Hamid Eslinger founded Frog Design in 1969, and this is now one of the world's most prominent and successful strategic design agencies, employing more than 1,000 strategists, designers, and technology specialists in 14 countries. He's a professor at universities in Germany, Vienna, and Shanghai, and has personally, and with his studio, been honored through literally hundreds of awards and various, signif various significant retrospectives. So we would like to add to that formidable list, Helmut, and invite you to join us as an honorary RTI. The Rolling Stones are turning out to be smart. Uh, they've recognized the excellence of two of our new RDIs before, long before us. The first is Tony Mavison, who designed the controversial album Their Satanic Majesty's Request in 1967. The second designer you'll hear about later on. Tony has a, is self-taught, claiming that his only genuine art teacher was Al Vandenberg, the American photographer and art director. He says, he taught me not to do things as others did, but to approach every new venture with fresh eyes, without preconceptions of how things have been done before. And few pu pupils will have benefited so much from such advice. Tony's produced some of the most beautiful original graphic work of recent times. We have all seen it and used it on stamps, on book covers, on Windsor and Newton ink pots, on the covers of the Radio Times and the Sunday Times. And every time we see it, it feels like a window's been open onto a wonderful day. This extraordinarily consistent artist, working without the aid of digital technology, has given us some memorable, memorable images that are perceptive, witty, and clear, and reminds us of the magical quality of craft. He has made books for children that have led through to literacy, and he's created a very difficult pack of playing cards, so beautiful that no game of racing demon is possible, because the seduction of the wonderful image on each card would lose you the game. David Pelham, Penguin's book art director for many years, has commented, he has the eye of an illustrator and the mind of a designer. Having first searched out the essence of his subject matter, he will then seemingly effortless, effortlessly manifest his thoughts into wonderfully composed and formalized but elaborate images that combine and allows him to solve visual problems with remarkable originality, skill, and panache. Love that word, panache. It's great. Tony has won the Victoria and Albert Museum's Illustration Award, scooped two, two gold and two silver awards from DNAD. He's the only illustrator to have achieved this. And in 1984, he received the Italian Franco Bolodoro Award for the world's most beautiful stamp. And his weather stamps made for the Royal Mail in 2001 was voted the most popular of British stamps. To place alongside these trophies, Tony, we offer you that of being an RDI and we welcome you to the faculty. of it, one could assume that Sandy Powell only does queens. Victoria Elizabeth Boleyn. But this would be to uh, misunderstand one of her main attributes. With the design and detail of her costumes, she helps us film goers not only understand character, but also to understand place and time. The director doesn't need to flag up dates and place names. We can feel them through her costumes. This is one of the main reasons why she's the most sought after costume designer of her time. She has epitomized Englandness through all ages. 16th century London and Hever Castle for Shakespeare in Love and the other Berlin girl. Early 19th century London for the young Victoria and all of these, of course, for Orlando. 
And with directors such as Martin Scorsese, she's given us Americanness, 1860s New York for the Gans of New York, 1940s for The Aviator, 1950s Connecticut for Far From Heaven, and contemporary Boston for The Departed. She's wary of too much historical accuracy. Her brilliance is in adding something else. She says, if we actually are trying to make a film with complete historical accuracy, it's too boring. You're not making museum pieces. It's not a documentary. It's a film. It's entertainment. Elsewhere, she says, the eureka moment, when you know a costume is just right, is the best part of the job. It usually comes during a fitting when you put everything together and suddenly there's your character. And the actor will say, right, I know exactly who I am now. I think we could all do that. Sandy Powell is another designer who's evolved outside of our design education system, quickly seduced out of college into the real world of super reality, first by Lindsay Kemp and then by Derek Jarman. And as John Lennon pointed out, reality leaves a lot to the imagination. Since then, during the last 27 years, she's designed 40 films. My maths isn't much better than my alphabet, but I can see that that's virtually one and a half films per year without any let up in quality. And for that alone, she deserves an Oscar. But this wouldn't be the first, because she's been nominated 10 times for an Oscar, winning three times. 1999 for Shakespeare in Love, 2005 for The Aviator, 2010 for The Young Victoria. And she's been nominated nine times for a BAFTA award, winning two. 1999 for Velvet Goldmine, 2010 for The Young Victoria. Two years ago, she was awarded an OBE. Well, our award feels like small fry and invisible compared to these glittering statues, but it's no less sincerely felt. And we're delighted that she's agreed to join us and become an RDI. She rang to say early in the week that she could not, after all, be here. So thank you very much for Richard Hudson for collecting it on her behalf. Good the faces don't get too alarmed as I work down the row. <clears throat> this time last year, we were here together celebrating the work of Mark Fisher. We imposed the very unusual penalty of having inviting him into the, had invited him into the fold, asking him to talk about his work, which he did, of course, with his usual elegance, wit, and courage. With Mark's untimely death in June, we lost someone very special, and no one knows this more than Patrick Woodruff, who worked closely alongside him for many years. Patrick's medium is light. He injects vast scale structures with energy and brings them into life. He makes sense of them, providing the temporal platform on which narratives can play out. He controls the atmosphere, the texture, the poetry of the spectacle, responding to the other two parts of the magical tripod of structure, sound, and light upon which the success of all these events must rest. Since 1975, he's been making huge public events such as rock concerts, festivals, and public celebrations literally visible to audiences all around the world simultaneously. Because the Olympic and Paralympic Games ceremonies was watched by four billion people. As we can all imagine, this work takes nerve. He says, I remember being nervous about getting it right. I know what to do, uh, I know what to, do to film a show in a stadium. But getting royal boxes and ceremonies and Olympic flags and athletes and all that stuff perfect was new for me. And he is, of course, the second designer to be detected by the Rolling Stones, for whom he has worked for 35 years. But in addition to the great stars of music, Lady Gaga, Michael Jackson, Genesis Alba, the Three Tenors, London Symphony Orchestra, he has let stars in more intimate productions of opera, ballet, and film. His folio also includes architectural schemes such, such as the Majeski Gardens at the V&A with Kim Wilkie, RDI, Somerset House, Cutty Sark, Prague Castle, and the exterior lighting show for the Millennium Dome in 2000 with Mark, Ma Mark Major, RDI. As well as being recognized as one of the pioneers of entertainment lighting design, Patrick's also been highly influential in developing more efficient lighting products, working closely with manufacturers in both the UK and overseas. And these developments include LED-based theatrical lanterns, new generations of moving headlights, enhanced efficiency and reliability. And the benefit of all this could be seen in the London Olympic opening and closing ceremonies, which were regarded as impressively efficient given this level of spectacle. 
Patrick, we're proud to invite you to join us as an RDI, provided that the light that you bring with you will not illuminate more than we're prepared to reveal. Saeed Sahedi works in a niche industry that is unusual in not wanting more customers. Anyone who's witnessed the long and painful process of recovery that amputees have to go through cannot fail to be re relieved for them when their prosthetic limb finally arrives and the future open up to them one, opens up for them once more. Watching the Paralympics reminded us that such futures can be spectacular because of these limbs and they bring more than relief they rapidly become sophisticated friends, sensitive and responsive to the individual. Many of these prosthetics, at the best, are designed by Saeed Zahedi. But his work spreads beyond the injured. He also works with the elderly and the disabled, with orthotic stroke patients and cerebral palsy children, where his special skill in having the patients to really understand the problems of the patient enables him to provide solutions in a systematic and scientific manner. As with a brush with the law, anyone might find ourselves in the unexpected and unwanted need of prosthetics. And what a comfort to know that someone has dedicated his working career to making them functional, comfortable, and smart. In every way. So smart they no longer need to be covered. Users are proud of them. And smart because of the deployment of technology that enables self-calibrating devices to mimic the walk of the individual. And he's developed intelligent sockets which can actuate and adjust themselves to the shape and volume changes of residual limbs. And it was Saeed and his design team who pioneered the use of hydraulics in prosthetic ankles, leading to the development of the award-winning Ashland foot. Over 30% of the UK NHS prosthetics and orthotics contracts are successfully undertaken by his company, Blatchford & Sons, who provide them, prove themselves to be super responsive as they work to provide, for example, a large number of quickly fitted prosthetics to the people of Haiti, where an estimated 4,000 people lost limbs as a result of the terrible earthquake in 2010. His list of awards and achievements would take up most of the evening to read, and they are as impressive as they should be. They include an OBE, two Queen's Awards for technical achievements, a Queen's Award for Innovation, a Prince of Wales Award for Innovation, and not to be left out, the Prince Philip Designer Award Special Nomination and there are many others. Said has described prosthetic design for amputees as where man and machine interface in harmony. I hope, Said, that these honors will interface in harmony with our more modest RDI award, and we welcome you to the faculty. This evening, um, I'm relinquishing this other wonderful medal and handing it on to my distinguished successor. Uh, Robin Levine handed this medal to me two extremely short years ago. And um, I then posed two questions. Um, do we still need a faculty of RDIs and do we still need the RSA to host us? I answered then, yes and yes to those two questions and proceeded to say why and how I hope to underpin words with action. I thought I'd set out my stall very cautiously and had don't promise too, too much ringing in my ears, just, just nudge, nudge things along a little bit. But I think nonetheless that it was not cautious enough. Uh, the nudging's been there but the movement not so much as I'd hoped. However, during my tenure we have had to introduce subscriptions and RDIs have been incredibly generous in their understanding and have coughed up, an act in itself that answers the two questions. Do we still need a faculty of RDIs? Clearly yes. And do we still need the RSA to host us? Clearly yes. However, the full joys of having our own bank account have not yet been realized, and I'm optimistic about that. But I failed to make as much noise as I planned on the traumas of design education, 
or whether there are plans for finding new ways for RDIs to spill their beans for the benefit of young designers. And this is in addition to the rebirth of the summer school, which took place this year at Dartington after a gap of four years. And I wanted to increase our female RDIs, some success here, two this year, and one last year. So it's a reasonably ship-shaped faculty that I pass on to Malcolm Garrett, who will set out his own stall, and I could not be happier about his election. Malcolm is a very special person. He's built a gravity-defying bridge between popular culture and design, forcing everyone to rethink everything. He's created something he called Connected Communications, forging a pathway into the digital world to make it useful, communicative, and interactive. It's led to the creation of one of the first digital agencies, AMX, in London Shoreditch in 1994, and in 2000 he became the first new media designer appointed as an RDI. The various studios he's established has covered a pretty unique spread of clients. Boy George and Dublin Bus Network, Buzzcox and Barclays Bank, Simple Minds and both British and Canadian governments. Kind of interesting link there. His folio, therefore, is very impressive, as is his CV. He's covered with honorary doctorates, sits on award panels, founder and member of the 5D World Builders at the 5D Institute at USC in California, and he's an official ambassador for both the Manchester School of Art and the Design Manchester 13 Festival. But more importantly than all of that is that he's a really lovely, generous man. And on behalf of the faculty, I can say that we're proud to have you as their master for the next two years, and we'll do everything that you say. Yeah, what, what's my Madonna microphone here? Oh, you have to take your glasses off. Oh, shit. Thank you. Oh, I don't know. I've got a black screen here. Oh, yeah, but that, mm, and I've left my notes over here. Start as I mean to go on. This is disturbing. I do have a black screen. I hate computers. <laughs> I really hate computers. I could just read it out. I was going to do this entirely as, as tweets, like, with, like, slides with 140 characters. I'm now thinking that I should have done that. Here's a nice technician coming to try and, and, and rescue my screen. Anyway, I can start, because the first slide is just a slide that looks like that. Uh, and, and really what I was going to ask is, what is the purpose of this talk? How can I make the correct use of my appointment as master? Hartmut, we need you to mend my computer. <laughs> oh. It's going to be one minute. Anyway, traditionally this address has been part life story, part kind of contextualizing, and as Dinah's just said, part setting out a stall. I've got to type in my password now. No, it's not awake yet. So, I thought about how past RDI masters have approached this. All have apparently seen it as a sort of rite of passage that you have to go through, a challenge. <laughs> I, I, apparently, I could elect not to give this talk uh, and, and, and have somebody else give it on my behalf. But, no, you can't do that. Oh, I'm now reserve, running on reserve batteries because it's not been plugged in. Okay, we can switch to this one now. So, this talk is like a collection of observations. Uh, it illustrates my personal journey uh, so far. And if I press this button, I hope Yes. Thank you. I once saw a very senior uh, executive at Apple 
give a similar presentation and have a similar thing happen to him. So if it can happen to, uh, to him, I can get by. Anyway, moving swiftly along. Uh, I asked lots of people adv uh, advice. I've been panicking about doing this for about six months or, well, a year. When I got the call from Dinah uh, about this time last year, it was like, have I been handed the poison chalice? This is like... Anyway, it's in the extreme honor. And, and so it's, a, it's been a bit like um, being at school and leaving your homework until right into the last minute. I was very, very good at doing that. And, and I was literally working on this like 30 minutes before. Uh, and anyway, everybody asked for advice just said, Malcolm, just be yourself, you'll be fine. So that's what I've been asking myself. What is myself? <laughs> uh, and so I've always, I've always also been told that, that people only ever take three things from a talk like this. So I'm only going to ask three questions and give three answers. Why am I a designer? What has motivated me as a designer? And finally, what can I now do as a designer now as I'm master of the faculty? We talk of design as a discipline. Design has many disciplines which suggest many sets way of, uh, set ways of doing things, but we are encouraged to challenge. Challenge the brief, challenge convention, challenge the client, and challenge the audience. And of course, challenge the speaker if uh, things go wrong. We're told that challenging ideas are the best. But the irony is, if we are questioning everything all the time, what is correct? And in this multimedia world, should we confine our knowledge to just one discipline? Anyway, why am I a designer? <coughs> This is, this is where I talk about how I got from there to here. I thought it'd be useful to show some early influences and to talk about some of the things that have shaped me and shaped my thinking. This is my spirograph. This is the very spirograph set that I had when I was, I don't know, six, seven years old. And, and my sister found it uh, recently when she was clearing out the family home. And I posted this on Instagram. Uh, this is it photographed on my kitchen floor, so it's a bit of a fuzzy photo. Uh, and, and some of my friends have said, only half jokingly, that they can see the origins of most of my designs in, in there. <laughs> but I actually, I had grander ambitions as a child. Uh, this is the post office tower. I was eight when this was, uh, was publicly opened in 1964. It's still considered an icon. Uh, with people queuing up to, to visit it every time it's opened. It's open uh, uh, on December the 17th, if anybody's interested. This was the most visible of the modernist buildings being built in the 60s. It inspired me to want to be an architect. Well, actually, I don't know whether wanting to be an architect was why I liked it or liking it is what made me want to be an architect. Anyway, with my Lego set, I always wanted to try and build the post office tower. But you can see the fatal flaw. The post office tower is round and Lego bricks are square. <laughs> so I, I was always frustrated, but still that didn't put me off. So we come to the, what is possibly the most significant of these early slides. This is a blank sheet of paper. I can remember vividly going to my dad saying, Dad, what should I draw? I had a passion to create something, but I really didn't know what it was that I was going to do. The, the blank paper kind of defeated me. Uh, uh, and what it, I realized is that... I've never really considered myself an artist because I find it difficult to fill this blank sheet of paper. I need to have a purpose. I need to find the correct use of creativity. I can't get started until there's a job to do. So this is the kind of where usually where I start. I call this kind of word games in pictures. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a fairly good illustration of how my mind works. I'm trying to convey everything that's in my mind simultaneously because everything there is inter interdependent. I want to be able to show enough detail immediately so that you get an overview and so you can kind of comprehend the, 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 the entirety, but also indicate that there's much more to absorb in the details. My mind always creates visualizations of problems, whether as a diagram like this or as a simple piece of typography. So, I'll take a step back now. And here I'd like to paraphrase Sir Ken Robinson, misquoting Sir Thomas Beecham on Desert Island Discs recently, where he said, the English don't understand music, they just like the noise it makes. So when I was 14, 
These, were the record, these records were essential noise. Led Zepp, Deep Purple, Sabbath. These were, you had to have these in your collection if you were like me. Rock music became the most important element that has shaped me as a teenager. I learned at that age that music is a prime social identifier. I found myself through identifying with certain schools of youth rebellion, and they shaped my teenage years. So, moving forward from 14, this is me at 21. <laughs> That's me on the right. <laughs> it's me and my girlfriend of the time at the Roundhouse, backstage at a Buzzcocks gig early in 1978. So, I think I must be 21. As you can see, by this point, music has become my lifestyle, and my lifestyle became my career. This is where it started. This poster kick-started my career. It's a poster I designed and printed while still at college. I was still in my second year on a, on a, uh, a graphics degree course at Manchester Poly, done for some, some friends of mine who happened to have a, a, a band that was, you know, quite in, they were quite enthusiastic about. And that, as I say, that kick-started my career. And from that point, early in 1977, um, what followed, and I can't really go into the detail of everything here, was years and years of work in the music industry. At first, for all other friends with bands, and then many more introductions from the record companies that they worked with. Consequently, and this is a double-edged sword, I did all of my growing up as a designer in the public eye. Um, so I never learned how to run a business, how to be professional. <laughs> Everything I did was published, so all of my mistakes were published. <laughs> but the curious effect also was that many of my sleeves from that period are now regarded as iconic works for a certain generation, including this one from 1980 that Peter Saville, RDI, particularly likes, and, and, well, you can see the references to tonight's event, if you have got your invitation. Um, so, as I say, I, I spent a lot of time in the 80s working with, with bands, sort of trying to escape the music industry almost. It was kind of shaping me, but I kind of felt I needed something more. So, is there more to life than music? Now, this is where I talk about my ongoing enthusiasm for science and technology and how I went digital. And I take another step backwards. We are shaped by what we grow up with, and I grew up surrounded by heavy industry, but ironically, in the middle of the mid-Cheshire countryside. Industrial installations like this one, now derelict, I photographed this sometime last year, uh, were literally at the end of my road. Um, but at the other end of the road, quite literally, were fields, full of dairy cows, because I was right in the heart of the Cheshire dairy industry. So it's kind of no wonder that I'm somewhat schizophrenic, uh, with an interest both in technology and a care for the planet. But out of this, out of the grey industrial landscape, I found something bright and inspiring. Because where I grew up, everything was owned by ICI. After the war, my parents were offered a house and a job, in order to get them to move from their hometown of Liverpool and work in the chemical industry for ICI. My dad worked for ICI, my sister worked for ICI, my brother worked for ICI, I didn't work for ICI, but I was inspired by ICI. And only recently I was delighted to, to realize that this ICI logo was designed by another RDI, Samisha Black, at the Design Research Unit. So that was wonderful all these years. Uh, uh, I've admired this and been influenced by it, and, um, and now I sit on the Samisha Black Awards Committee, and it's kind of nice. It's a, it's a nice connection. I thought I should also show this, because <coughs> I've always been a futurist at heart. As a child, I avidly devoured science and innovation, but as portrayed in popular culture, Supercar, Fireball, XL5, Stingray, Thunderbirds, James Bond, The Man from Uncle, The Avengers, Danger Man, the list goes on. I kind of devoured it. Um, <sighs> the world of tomorrow has always been something on my mind. And so the opening sequence of Stingray proclaiming anything can happen in the next half hour has remained an inspirational thought. Uh, which sort of, again, leaping forward, jumping ahead, being an enthusiastic futurist somehow naturally led to this. 
Now what this is, this is an article I wrote for a design magazine early in 1992. This is two or three years before the World Wide Web began to make its mark. As a, and it was written as a response to critics of computers in design. It was an attempt to drag the design industry, then very resistant to anything to do with computers, into the 21st century. It poses questions about the role of digital publishing, many of which are being addressed and answered only now, 20 years later. So, asking the question, the book is dead, it started a campaign for digital. And I wrote lots of articles, gave lots of talks, made lots of presentations. These are just a few of the, 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 the snapshots of that. As nobody had really produced any of the work that I was getting excited about, I found that I had to imagine it instead. I found myself writing about its potential and giving lectures about where our digital future might lead us. One thing I did learn is never try to predict the future. You will be wrong. But anyway. <laughs> Working digital, in parallel to that, I did, was actually working in digital media. And I was working and exploring across many platforms. Um, in 20 years, I've worked across all platforms from CD-ROM to internet to mobile, and as on this slide, interactive cinema. I've always championed interactive design, not as a discipline apart, but as a strategic, complementary, and integrated part of the communications landscape an essential component of the business of design, and as we are seeing more and more, of contemporary society. It is not the only component, but increasingly the one about which all else rotates. My early grasp with the importance of this shift towards digital, as Dinah noted, was one of the reasons why I was nominated in 2000 as the first designer in interactive media to become an RDI, of which I'm rightfully proud. Back then it was still called new media. We wondered when it was going to stop being new. Um, I, was seen, I think I was seen as a new head with an old pair of hands, or vice versa. I'm not sure which. I've done exactly what I feared I wouldn't do, and that's get one of my sheets out of order. I'll come back to that one. Next up, this, is, it's, this brings me to new challenges for education. Uh, as I've suggested, we are what we grow up with. And this slide is a crude illustration I produced for a talk in 2003, where I asked myself the question, how old are the people who have grown up always being able to control their screens with remote controls? I call them the PlayStation generation, and I believe that their brains would be wired in a slightly different way. They would have different expectations from us of the hardware that they grew up with. I wondered then what these people would be doing when they emerge from a university and begin to influence society in real and practical ways. Well, that was 10 years ago, and I calculated that they would have been 12 in 2003, so they'll be 22 now and leaving university. And I think we can see the results already. But, as has been noted by someone else earlier, things are already moving on. Uh, and um, it was a PlayStation generation then now I think we need to call them cloud kids, uh, because the technology now lives in space all around us, and we carry access to it everywhere we go. We can't sit still. And I want to quote Ken Robinson here. I've got Ken Robinson's book, and I saw Ken Robinson speak in this very room uh, uh, some years ago, and, and he was awe-inspiring. And, and uh, he's, he's done a lot of thinking about, about the, the, the influence of technology and, uh, on creativity. So I'll, I'll just read a, a, a couple of things. We are caught up in a social and economic revolution. This revolution is comparable to the industrial revolution of the 19th century, and it, had, and it has still hardly begun. To survive it, we need a new conception of human resources. Current approaches to education and training are hampered by ideas of intelligence and creativity that have wasted untold talent and ability. To develop these resources, we need radically new strategies. We won't survive the future simply by doing better what we have done in the past. Raising standards is no good if they're the wrong standards. So, that kind of brings me to what motivates me as a designer now. It's all very well your work being icono iconographic. And, and this, again, was, this is the first record sleeve I designed, again, when I was still at college, 
uh, uh, I think it was right at the beginning of my third year. And it was featured in the V&A exhibition, uh, Postmodernism exhibition uh, uh, last year. And only this week it was being discussed on MoMA, uh, on the MoMA New York blog as an iconic design. But kind of what's the point? I find myself, that's where the, the other sheet went wrong. Anyway, <laughs> this is quite easy. Do I just, do I exploit the fact that, that a lot of my work is well known and, and, and sell out, or do I use it to build, do I use those ideas and build something for the future? So exploitation or exploration, I think you know which one I'm going to go for. But after the outcome, um, many of my old music clients are also coming back for more, and sometimes they don't really know why. This poster, quoting Howard DeVoto, the singer in the band magazine, whose record sleeve we saw earlier, is quoting Dostoevsky, and in some ways it kind of, kind of sums up my thinking. But, on the other hand, I've come to realize that we live, we actually live in the age of the 55-year-old teenager. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, I'm not as old as my dad was when he was younger than me. Think about that. <laughs> and I think this is a really significant change in society. I really don't believe that I think or act like my parents, who were already old and acting old by now. My parents would never have dreamed nor even conceived of living the life that I continue to live. Like many of my contemporaries, I refuse to grow up, and I think this is a good thing. This is actually another musician friend of mine, Jean-Marie Carroll, who was in a band called The Members, whose record sleeves I designed back in the, uh, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And, and he still plays and performs and, and publishes his own CDs. And I went to see him perform with his band, The Members, at the 100 Club on, on Oxford Street a couple of weeks ago. And I looked around and I realized I was in an audience of, of people of a certain age <laughs> in their leather jackets and their jeans. They really had refused to grow up. So, time to get serious. What more could I be doing now? In order to answer this, I've been, I've been assessing myself. What it is to be yourself, as everyone has been telling me. What do I actually do? What am I actually good at? So, this is what I've learned. This is what I do. I curate, collate, mediate, meditate, moderate, debate, dissipate, define, refine, translate, inform, explain, enthuse, diffuse. In short, I am a new mediator. I'm a natural helper. I can be good at explaining things, that much I know. I understand simplicity. I know how to make complex things appear simple. Perhaps I'm prone to be naive, but hopefully in a good way. So, what I want to do now is I want to kind of review what do I actually do already? You know, in this kind of looking forward to what, to, to, to what I could be doing as master. What do I do already? This is where I have to say what a wonderful person I am. So apologies for that. <laughs> I've played an active role in education for over two decades. I'm, I've, I've been involved at student, parent, faculty, industry, and now city council level. I've worked at every educational level from primary through tertiary to postgraduate to professional training. I've had a variety of involvements with various professional bodies in the UK and abroad. I sit on committees, I judge awards, I advise businesses, I talk to the public. So, what I want to talk about is one of the most rewarding things that I currently do. And again, Dinah mentioned this. Most recently I've been working with Manchester School of Art. And this is very personal to me because this is where I studied graphic design back when it was Manchester Polytechnic. And in 1984, I, was, I gave an internship to a young Manchester Poly student called David Crow. He is now Dean and Pro Vice Chancellor of what he has recently renamed the Manchester School of Art. He noticed that it said School of Art above the door and rather than getting lost in the middle of an, an acronym, MMU, uh, he went back to first principles. And this year, the school is celebrating its 175th anniversary. And last week, officially opened, 
a magnificent new building designed by Peter Clegg, RDI, or rather Peter Clegg's firm, Field and Clegg Bradley, and this is the, the, the new building. I could talk volumes about this wonderful building. But anyway, Manchester is the oldest school of art in the country after the Royal College, and I'm proud to be part of that heritage. More recently, um, well, I've been, I've been external moderator for the past five years, uh, and, and they have to kind of pension you out after a while because you have to remain objective, uh, and it was becoming a bit too subjective. So having concluded that appointment, I've now been employed by the Dean as an official ambassador to the Manchester School of Art. And one of my uh, tasks this year was to co-curate what became the Design Manchester Festival. It was intended to be a single event to coincide with the opening of the building, but it turned into a week-long series of events, and with Mancunian directness, what else could it be called but Design Manchester? Uh, amongst the events uh, was uh, included the conference in the town hall, a magnificent building itself uh, built to celebrate design and industry at a time when Manchester was seen as if not the center of the world, certainly the heart of the Industrial Revolution. I set the theme of longevity as the theme for the, for the, the, the conference, and I believe, that design, I believe in design that should last, as well as being sustainable, it should be built, not to be recycled, but to stay forever, or a significant period of time. The list of speakers we attracted was fantastic, and you'll see uh, some of them up there on the screen. I was also delighted that Nat Hunter and Mark Shaler from the RSA accepted my invitation to come and talk about the great, their great recovery project and to bring some shocking reality amidst the celebration of design to the day's events. For years, we're getting back to the world of tomorrow. Sorry, is this jumping around a bit? I don't know, it seems that way. Uh, anyway, since I was that big, I've been collecting... Uh, uh, um, well, collecting everything, actually. I never seem to be able to throw anything away. Um, and so my collection of books, toys, ephemera, and even my clothes, not the ones I'm stood up in, of course, uh, um, as part of the ongoing program at the, at the School of Art, um, and as another practical way of giving something back, I've begun to donate this vast collection to the, uh, the library, the university library, as a resource for design students. This was an invite for, for, we had a small exhibition of some of the pieces a year ago. Um, so you can see, it. we've already started doing, doing good things in Manchester. Um, so what do I do next? I now find myself in this new context as master of the faculty. It feels like this is a new beginning, and it's a time for some exploration and some action. As I've said, throughout my professional life, I've been gathering it does seem like I've been gathering more and more industry roles and responsibilities, working with many professional bodies, each of whom represent different aspects of the industry. Now is the time to try and make some sense of this and to try to coordinate these previously disparate initiatives. I have a perhaps naive idea to help bring together and exploit their commonalities, a council of design, if you like, but with the faculty as the facilitator. I think there is the clear opportunity to put the RSA through the faculty at the center of a conversation between these professional bodies. With this in mind, I'm also able, uh, delighted to be able to contribute to the new RSA strategy, which has a focus on public service and communities, learning and creativity, promoting arts and creativity, enterprise, design, and manufacturing. So I think there's time for a breakthrough. <sighs> As a kind of example, the DEC, the Disasters Emergency Commission, represents 14 UK aid agencies. It's objective to quickly spring into action and call on any of these partners for appropriate responses for, 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 in any situation. We need a kind of a DEC for industry bodies that represent design. They have individual aims, but with overlapping remits. Can I help them work together for a common purpose, or for common purposes? I'm aware that this is not a new idea. Others have engaged in a similar quest in the past, and conversations have taken place over a number of years. I would like now to be part of those conversations. Informally, I've already had, had expressions from, of support from many of the bodies, but it's probably too early to name them. Uh, suffice to say, I am already encouraged. 
What I think is the new opportunity here is that the faculty does not have a competitive, competitive agenda, yet it is an absolute powerhouse of the finest designers on the planet. So I'm excited to have been elected to represent that body and to be able to carry their weight and draw on their expertise to help me to do this. As a start, I am to be appointed, along with one or two other RDIs and RSA staff, to the Associate Parliamentary Design and Innovation Group. I had to write that down in order to remember it. <laughs> but uh, they can advise and influence government policy. So, Ken, I'll be channeling your thoughts. So, in conclusion, this talk was not about facts and figures and processes, but it's about passion, engagement, commitment, and purpose. In answer to my three questions, why am I a designer? Because I've always been more interested in other people's problems than my own. What motivates me as a designer? I, want, I like to think beyond the transient, the ephemeral, or the disposable in design. I also want to think beyond the icons and personal milestones. So what more can I now do as a designer? Well, hopefully I can use this unique opportunity to do something useful for the industry and to put the RSA and the RDIs at the core of a powerful initiative for design. For me, I hope to now fill my blank sheet of paper in a different way. For me, it's a new beginning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Malcolm, for uh, laying out an exciting uh, manifesto. Thank you, Diane. I think you were far too modest about your achievements, uh, actually, which have been substantial. And uh, congratulations again to the new RDIs. Um, before we close, I'd just like to thank all the raw designers for their positive contribution to the RSA in the last year, in particular the educational interventions that have taken place that have been extremely valuable to the students, to our students in RSA schools, RSA staff, and others that RDIs have shared uh, their time and expertise with, with, with. I hope that, I'm sure that these activities will continue and develop in future and that our new role designers will participate in this program. Now, sadly, I do know what the next half an hour contains and I'm going to tell you it. I feel like I've kind of lost the kind of momentum already, but um, can I ask the new role designers to remain behind briefly to assemble on the main staircase, staircase landing for a quick photograph, so new RDIs wait behind. Uh, everyone else, Please go to the Benjamin Franklin room for drinks, but when you can do whatever you want in the next half an hour, uh, please leave the great room by uh, these stairs or by uh, those stairs and go as quickly as possible because we've got to, uh, you won't believe this, we've got to now turn this into a dining room over the next uh, 30 minutes. And, and for those who are joining us for dinner, uh, please come back up to this room at 10 past 8 when dinner is announced. Thank you all for joining us today, this evening. <laughs>